Hi, everybody. My name is uh, Ulf Jepson, Associate Professor, Lund University, and Vice Chair of uh, the MIA Group. Uh, and I am here then to just give you a short introduction on the second topic that we have, the second presentation on integrated modeling in practice. The, the presentation itself will be given by Peter Bach. Peter Bach is a uh, postdoc at uh, Monash University in Australia and uh, also at Erbag in Switzerland. And he did his PhD in uh, 2014. And he is uh, a member of the, the MIA specialist group. And he's also the, the chair of the working group on uh, modeling of uh, integrated urban water systems. With him today, we also have um, Lorenzo Benedetti, who is uh, the former chair of, of that working group. I think Lorenzo will be available for the Q&A, but uh, the presentation itself will uh, be given by, by Peter Bach, and it's uh, approximately a 15 minute presentation. So Peter, please. Thanks a lot, Ulf, and thanks everyone for joining us. Um, so really what we're going to talk about today in this second topic is um, really the outcomes of what the working group has been doing um, over the past few years, uh, really is revisiting what the barriers are to integrated modeling in practice. So just to make sure I can control the slides and just to acknowledge um, a few people who have been actively involved in this particular activity, including Lorenzo, who's here today, uh, Kim Komas, and Adrian Como, who have helped uh, in both workshops as well. Uh, and thank you to all the workshop participants. So if any of you who are here with us today have joined the workshop in the past, uh, well, you get to see a bit of a snapshot of what we found. So really the story begins with, um, I guess, integrated modeling and really the first mentions of it back in 1982, where a study by Goya et al in the well, in the Swiss um, Valley of Glatt, um, found that being able to look at the entire urban drainage system rather than just its individual components can lead to much better management outcomes uh, and therefore more cost-effective solutions. Now, this study is one of the first um, studies that really kick-started a whole evolution of modeling uh, towards more integrated approaches where rather than considering a treatment plan on its own or a sewer system on its own, we started combining models to really understand the feedback loops and then um, optimize based on these feedbacks to create better holistic and you know, more, effective uh, more effective decisions. Now, this increased uh, quite a lot in the research. Um, and in 1992, uh, there was a conference called the Interurba where a lot of this knowledge was brought together and um, a lot of researchers got together to try and figure out, okay, where are we at? Um, a publication a year later in 1993 in Water Science and Technology um, outlined some of the first findings uh, and some of the major breakthroughs. But this particular paper by Le Clema et al. also mentioned 18 key barriers um, that the adoption of integrated modeling in practice still faced. Um, so integrated modeling and integrated assessment in general. Now, we are now in 2017. It's been more than 20 years since this paper was released and many have tried to revisit these barriers um, over the last few years as well. Um, where are we at? So we've had a major change in water management, uh, big paradigm shift. Uh, many of you will probably be aware of the integrated urban water management paradigm, which is taking shape in many different forms across the world, um, starting to look at our systems in a more holistic way and really from multiple objectives. We've seen some major changes um, and challenges uh, globally. Uh, the legislation itself has also changed quite significantly. We've had, for example, the Water Framework Directive at the turn of the millennium in Europe, uh, in Australia, where I've been working uh, for quite a few years. We've also seen some new legislation put into place that helped the adoption of decentralized stormwater management. And if we look to the models out there, we're also seeing a much greater diversity of model use um, across the urban water sector and in particular integrated model use. So studies that look at the interaction of the sewer system treatment plan and the impacts on receiving waters. We've seen studies that look at the interaction of um, water recycling on the existing centralized systems. 
But the question is where are we at now with the actual adoption of these models in practice? And with all the different softwares that have been published over the last few years, um, which sort of underpin integrated modeling or try to really communicate the benefits of integrated modeling, are we actually seeing any real adoption? And if, if so, what are some of the barriers that we still face? So from 20 years on since that 1993 paper, how have these barriers changed? So as part of the working group, we got together um, with the aim of understanding how these barriers have changed um, and if there are any new ones. Uh, the focus of the work we did was really looking at what are currently the perceived challenges and urgency of these existing barriers and what these barriers are, I'll summarize shortly. We looked at what are, I guess, the existing outstanding and most important barriers that we still face today in practice. And I guess, how can we be smarter in the modeling research and application of these models in practice? So we began by looking at the 18 barriers. Now, I don't expect you to read all these 18 barriers, but um, to, to sort of illustrate it for you, we categorized them into a few key groups. So there were some barriers relating to policy and regulation. So this idea that we've got standards that are currently in place that may not necessarily require integrated modeling or may actually prevent the use of integrated modeling um, or at least are not framed in a way that allows us to use these models to their, uh, to their benefit um, and to their, uh, to their optimum. We have administrative fragmentation which is actually a very common um, thing that you'll read in a lot of integrated modeling studies, the siloed approach to managing the urban water infrastructure. We have barriers uh, for the decision-making process and barriers that deal with model complexity. So how do we make the decisions and how can these models, I guess, help in the process and, um, and why can't we make them yet? As well as with all these models around, um, modeling feedbacks between different subsystems can be a quite complex task. Um, what if these models are too complex for anyone to use? And finally, the last one um, is related to communication. Uh, so we've got researchers working on models. We have practitioners who have to make decisions about how to manage infrastructure. Is there communication between them? What about communication between practitioners or between researchers to forward the knowledge? So we held two workshops in 2015. The first one was at the Water Matrix Conference in Gold Coast, Australia. Uh, we had a predominantly, I guess, Australian, uh, Asian, some North American, European crowd. Um, and then the second workshop was held in September in Mont Sinan in Canada at the Urban Drainage Modeling Conference. Uh, there we had a more predominantly North American, European audience. Uh, in both workshops, we had about 20 participants each and we had two major activities. So the first activity, you'll see a, a photo on the right here um, where you see a poster with post-it notes and dots. We asked participants to, I guess, judge how challenging and how urgent these five different categories were um, for integrated model adoption. And to also, I guess, list some thoughts and keywords that they could think of when they hear the words for example, policy regulation or model complexity. Then we had a more extended discussion um, in hope of trying to list the top five barriers that we still face to try and prioritize um, which barriers that um, researchers and practitioners should try and address um, going forward. So to give you some insights of what we found, just to start with the first activity. So what you see here are some radar plots. Now, um, on the left, you'll see the results for how urgent people rated various barriers. On the right, you see how challenging these barriers were. The thick line is the median. So if you think 40 participants, it's roughly the median of ratings. Uh, it goes from zero to one. So one being most and zero being least. Um, and the top row is the first workshop and the bottom row is the second. So to remind you again, the top row, I guess, would be predominantly more on the, um, I guess, Asia Pacific region and the bottom would be the more North American European ratings. A uh, few things to notice here, for example, uh, there was generally a consensus that communication uh, is still a very urgent um, challenge that we face. Uh, and people were pretty much convinced that, um, you know, or many people were of the same opinion that we need to address the communication issue. And there'll be more about this particular aspect uh, shortly. 
Um, but there were also disagreements about how urgent or how challenging in this case uh, policy and regulation is. And this can be explained by the difference in, I guess, the region you're working in. So there was a lot of discussion, for example, about how there is already policy in place, but it's at the very high level and without any local scale policy that clearly helps or clearly promotes the use of integrated modeling, we may not see much adoption because whilst people understand what the high level goals are, uh, without any clear guidance, they would be unable to really apply the tools um, at their disposal uh, in, a, in an adequate way. Um, there was also much uncertainty around really how challenging the policy regulation barrier really is. Um, to, I guess, highlight a few other findings from this particular exercise, um, people were also not convinced that decision making, for example, was a very urgent challenge um, because it's quite heavily guided by policy. The administrative fragmentation, as you'll see um, in the green, so on the right hand side, was another one of those uncertain barriers. And that was because some people um, genuinely believe it's not about whether your administration, whether you have multiple organizations working on a problem or a single organization, it's about how you communicate within that organization and between organizations. So a very interesting discussions. Uh, some other key topics that emerged from looking at these results included things like the gap between research and practice, that there is still a clear um, disconnect between how researchers build models um, and how these would address policy and regulation, and also how they communicate between each other. Um, then there was discussion about problem-based versus impact-based approaches, um, really proactive versus reactive approaches, and just how we would assess um, a particular management problem, uh, whether it is from looking at the problem or working in a more scenario context, so assessing impacts and then making a decision based on that. Um, there was talk about position papers, guidance manuals and training, how we don't really have enough of those, but how these could really help um, researchers and practitioners to better understand model complexity, but also how we can address policy and regulation. Social cost benefits, uh, community awareness are pretty important issues in the management of urban water systems nowadays, and we don't include these enough. Uh, there could be a way of bridging the administrative fragmentation and just improving communication in general. And then we had two very, very strong themes of politics, influencing the decision-making quite heavily um, and policy and regulation, but also the risk aversion that's really within the industry and that's prevalent quite globally and that we want to make decisions with lots of confidence and we don't like to take a lot of risks, um, especially when we um, start making um, very important decisions about water infrastructure planning into the future. But uh, when we boiled it down to really what the top five barriers would be uh, that we would face and would like to deal with going forward, uh, it actually became the top three priorities um, because a lot of the barriers um, interconnected. And so there was agreement across both workshops that these three keywords, communication, data and coordination, uh, would be three pretty important things that we would gain a lot from addressing. So to go into some detail here, with communication, as I mentioned earlier, it's really about communication within organizations. So across the organization from planners to your asset managers and operators, and also between organizations. So a water utility with a local municipality uh, or even sharing knowledge across countries. Um, the research practice communication is also quite important. Uh, there was a lot of discussion about how researchers, they do a lot of publications, but practice doesn't really read these. How can we actually enable the transfer of knowledge in a better way? Um, but many agreed that if we can get the communication right in every combination of it, it would be a key enabler to really overcome a lot of the barriers. Uh, some opportunities uh, to help um, include this greater connectivity through technology nowadays. We are very connected whether it's through our Connect or through a lot of just workshops and conferences. And there's also an increasing number of demonstration and illustration projects uh, where integrated modeling is used, where an integrated approach um, showed some clear benefits. So this is where you know, we can leverage uh, the communication aspect. Um, data, we've had a lot of uh, talk about data just now, and it's really about too much versus too little and the quality and availability of data. Security concerns were also an issue, 
but with new data sources and a greater availability of data through open standards uh, and other new data standards, this is uh, also slowly becoming a good opportunity that we can harness. And finally, the coordination between experts and models, um, being able to understand how we can share knowledge and um, make sure the models are set up appropriately across uh, to reflect the management of different organizations was quite important. Um, so focus groups or learning from the open source story in information technology could be a way of, um, a way of figuring out methods to go forward. Uh, with lots of platforms and meeting points between stakeholders, this is, this is something we can definitely try and address in the future. So really to summarize, um, <clears throat> we have many of the old barriers that we've overcome, but there are still some fundamental ones that still exist, the policy and regulation, um, to a lesser degree, the administrative fragmentation. Um, I think one thing is important, there is a difference in the perception of what really is a barrier um, and there's uncertainty uh, around what really the barrier means to integrated modeling. Uh, many people thought based on the local context. So it's, it's very hard to define a universal um, set of challenges um, and we really have to understand the local context. But um, many do agree that with better communication, coordination and good data, a good awareness of data issues, um, then we can really ensure better and efficient uh, adoption of integrated models in practice. So I'll leave it there and look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, almost on time, perfect as usual. We are, uh, I tend to see that there is a uh, little bit of hesitancy in terms of questions <laughs> um, compared to the number of questions that we had for the, for the first presentation. Um, I'll just start with, with one of my own to Peter and Lorenzo. I saw in your slide with the, the radar, with the radar uh, sketch there that from Workshop one, complexity was not really considered a challenge. Whereas for the second workshop, it was high in, in that complexity was a challenge. My experience is that it is, when you do catchment, sewer, wastewater treatment plant, receiving water together, then complexity is a, a problem. Uh, but uh, I just would like to hear your comment, comments on that and why, why it was so different. <coughs> workshops yeah so the model complexity issue was I guess one of those um, hot topics that was discussed and was dependent on the local context uh, so for one in terms of I guess the difference in the geographic opinions um, I guess it also relates to what kinds of models are used uh, within the different regions in Europe, the discussion was predominantly around a lot of the, I guess, the combinations of uh, sewer system treatment plant receiving water bodies, uh, detailed hydrodynamic models, or just um, a number of different process models. Whereas in Australia, the discussion was more around your continuous water balance hydrologic models, catchment based assessments. So I think just from that already, you see a difference in model complexity, but, um, I guess many people, I think they see it as, you know, if, if there is a will to do integrated modeling, um, then there will be investments into training, uh, building knowledge, a knowledge base and training people to actually use these models. Um, and that if you have the policy and regulation that drives, um, drives the use of integrated modeling, then there'll be a few key model candidates that will um, that will lend themselves to addressing this policy um, or achieving these policies. And that's where the model complexity sort of gets addressed in that because I guess with no choice, uh, when faced with little choice, um, people will start building the knowledge base to understand these models. And um, the issue, if, if somebody wants, wants to start working on, on modeling integrated urban water systems where, where do you think they should start i mean if they start to model everything on their own they will soon run into huge problems in terms of, of the time and effort and, and probably never get anything uh, finished what what the tools would would you and, and lorenzo suggest for people who want to get into this field lorenzo would you like to start 
Uh, yeah, of course, it really depends on the on the problem at hand, uh, on the on the scale of the of the issue. If it is just the urban uh, the urban water system, or it's a whole river basin model. But in general, uh, um, often there are already some models available of the subsystems. So the the person in charge of integrating those models should. Uh, yeah, plug in the experience of the of the modelers that have worked on the separate systems and uh, try to figure out whether there is a way to simplify and and yeah and at that uh, moment also decide which which tool is the best to do that uh, to simplify and integrate those models and um, yeah otherwise if there is no model at all then well it's a it's, it's quite a challenge but uh, usually it's it's an interdisciplinary team working on that with uh, with one person in charge of integrating the the knowledge and models i guess from my end where to start there are a number of uh, modeling packages out there that if you can, I guess, get your hands on, you can really start trying. But I think starting simple is the key. Often in the integrated modeling um, aspect, what you want to do is you want to try and understand that interaction, how that interaction contributes to uh, the greater benefit. And a tool as simple as even Excel, which we found a lot of people rely on, can already give you a, a good starting point. Start playing around with what happens if I change you know the flow into uh, a certain um maybe the flow in a certain part of a sewer system through control strategies how does that affect uh, the wastewater treatment plant or um, how do how would my rain tank uh, interact with the urban drainage system and then from there you slowly build up your understanding of the complexity and at some point when you venture into a very detailed um, system uh, some of the existing packages can already help by providing you these tools. Thank you. And uh, for all, all uh, attendees out there, you should know that uh, Lorenzo Benedetti has, well, 20 years experience in doing exactly this, modeling the whole integrated urban water system and uh, simplifying models and running them on supercomputers and all these things. So if anybody should know how to do this modeling, it's <laughs> Peter, of course. Uh, there is a question from uh, Sukanya Saikia, which reads, uh, would statistical modeling be the best to model influent flow data into a wastewater treatment plant with precipitation with regard to change in intensity of rainfall? Uh, Specific uh, question, if we talk about yes. the wastewater system, waters and wastewater system, but uh, still. Any suggestion on that? Um, yes. Uh, well, to model influent, uh, influent of the treatment plant, uh, of course, if you want to model dynamically the plant, you need dynamic data. So you need uh, to have something that, uh, yeah, that feeds your plant model with uh, dynamic quality and quantity. And this can be done uh, either with a statistical model or with a more physically based model. If you can make a simple model of, of your sewer system or just a very empirical uh, influence generator model, then there are, yeah, you can uh, adopt. There is some literature available to, to generate quality from, uh, from uh, rainfall or flow data if available. So it, it depends what data you have and how much time you have to develop your influence generator. There might be some. Uh, simple statistical model good enough for that. Thank you, Lorenzo. Peter, do you want to add anything? Or? Uh, yeah, I guess one thing to bear in mind when you're considering these statistical models is understanding how, I guess, the, the data or the information propagates through your integrated model. So if you're starting with a very simple model at the beginning, um, it's good to be aware of how that simplicity may affect maybe more complex models downstream. Uh, so especially in the urban drainage case. So I'm, I'm not the, uh, the urban drainage model and my specialization integration is more at the, the higher level. So planning and looking at 
models of catchments and stormwater systems uh, linked with urban planning. But um, from what I've, uh, what I've read and what I've reviewed, that's the one thing that would jump out to me as well. Thank you. Okay, we have another one from uh, Mohammed Hamouda asking um, that uh, integrating qualitative and quantitative variables is an in, in an integrated uh, model poses a huge challenge. Any tips on how to avoid subjectivity and oversimplification in this respect? I think it comes down to the modeling aim. So if you can define your modeling aim from the very start, and I see this happen a lot where people embark on integrated modeling without a clearly defined aim, then I think um, you lose the ability to be able to judge at what point you're oversimplifying um, your integrated model. Um, I guess it's a trade-off to me when I see this, um, the challenge of qualitative and quantitative variables in an integrated model because you need data to help set up your model, calibrate it and validate it. But data acquisition for an integrated modeling study is far more complex and more costly at times. So I guess if I were to embark on this kind of study to avoid subjectivity and oversimplification, I would revisit my aims and iteratively either begin, well, you could begin with a simple model and gradually um, gradually make it more complex, gradually introduce the elements that you think will affect the feedback loops and in general, the process you're modeling until you've reached a pragmatic point where you can say, I think this model adequately addresses the aims and gives us insights that we, um, you know, that we're hoping to, um, to acquire. Lorenzo, happy with that? Uh, yes. Uh, I don't have much experience with qualitative uh, variables, so. Then we'll ask you instead, uh, there's a question from uh, Michael Gee. He says, um, about model incompatibilities, do you think striving towards a consensus on the modeling platform and type of model is feasible or even advisable? Um, well, no, I really think it, it depends on uh, the people working on, uh, on the models. Of course, they have experience on uh, some platforms and models. It depends also on the models which are already available that you can use and that they can be integrated straight away or need to be simplified. So again, the usual answer is, is it depends. So it depends on the background of the people and of the, of the project. Okay. Uh, I've got something oh, interesting to add. It always depends. Yeah. That's really? the standard answer. Yeah, it depends. Standard engineering answer. Well, an interesting finding at the workshop um, was this discussion of um, the incompatibilities of models. And, uh, the, the joke of the workshop was we used to have everyone um, with their own unique models of you know, the system. Now we have everyone with their own unique platforms for integrating models. And I think the short answer is um, even if it was feasible or advisable, I don't think we can achieve it due to just the diversity of modeling that's done out there. However, I think where we can um, unify models is really at the documentation and development of the theory behind it and the algorithms. Um, I think if, if we can at least have decent documentation of every, well, a lot of the models that are out there, then, you know, shopping for your models to integrate could be done in a more scientifically rigorous way. Um, so there, there have been attempts successfully in the past. So the activated sludge models um, are one example where you had task groups that then led to the development of the river water quality models. Um, but I think in our present day with just the diversity of models that we have and the different levels of integration, I think it's quite important to have the more uh, I guess, rigorous documentation and um, make it clear what the interfaces look like so that people integrating them can, um, can be aware of, I guess, where the errors might occur or what uncertainties they are going to face. Thank you. 
I see one question here from, it's an anonymous question, but uh, relevant when you uh, think about integrated modeling of, of urban system, it says, uh, okay, when it comes to adoption of integrated modeling in urban systems, we actually might deal with several stakeholders. And they may have different interests and different protocols for data collection. Goes back a bit to what you said, Peter, during your presentation on organizational issues as well, different organizations dealing with different parts of, of, of the system. Um, could you expand a little bit about that uh, and your experience on, on, on the matter? Yeah, so in terms of, and I'll, I'll, I'll give my answer, and I think Lorenzo might be able to also comment on this afterwards because he's worked quite a lot as well in Europe. Uh, from my experience um, in working with stakeholders across Australia, um, with the integrated water management paradigm, there is a certain sense of trying to be, uh, trying to come up with more formalized um, data collection methods, uh, I guess data management and processing. And I think really what's key is to get the dialogue going, to get them to see what the model does, even if it's on a hypothetical case study, and then to um, explain to them very clearly what the data requirements are. Often then through discussions between them, um, a lot of this information can then trickle through and you then get an opportunity to, I guess, acquire um, different um, all the different data you need for the models. And then with time, hopefully, through demonstration um, of one case study, if your organization is very proactive, which in, at least in Melbourne, we've got a few proactive organizations, this can trickle through, um, through uh, word, of, word by mouth, uh, when people talk to their colleagues, when other organizations um, come for advice. So I think the key is to empower the stakeholders you're working with. And I guess it's the start to really work through the data issues perhaps with, um, with a few key stakeholders who will drive the project from their end. And then um, from there, we can then slowly identify, okay, how can we formalize data collection protocols uh, more readily? Or how can we um, help make the, um, the adoption of the integrated models more efficient in the organizations? Lorenzo seems yep. good to answer, yeah. Yes, and um, yeah, I will add uh, a short comment on the on the different interest side of uh, having multiple stakeholders. And I would like to highlight how uh, integrated modeling is really a wonderful tool to have all these stakeholders speaking the same language. It's really a great uh, tool to to manage the negotiation between the the stakeholders, because these these models well show quantitatively how the decisions uh, made by one stakeholder might impact another one. So, well, that's, that's really helpful in when you have uh, multiple stakeholders with different interests on the same table. Thank you, guys. Um, it's not an actual question in the list, so I'm just making it up as I go along. Uh, but I think it could be interesting. What, what, what in your experience? The experience from Lorenzo and Peter is extensive. What are the, the best examples that, that, that we can find around the world where integrated modeling of the whole wastewater, wastewater system has been done and actually been come to some practical use? Yeah, yeah. Lorenzo. From, uh, yeah, from my side, I have direct experience in two wonderful projects, one uh, in the city of Odense uh, in Denmark and one in Eindhoven in the Netherlands. And, um, well, there is uh, some, uh, some literature on those uh, two projects and you're welcome to ask me for more information. And they are all both uh, on, on the um, integration of sewer, plant and river for water quality and uh, for dynamic prediction of, uh, of water quality in the receiving waters and for real-time control and optimization of the sewer and plants. And Peter, any experience from that? I've got, um, so in terms of 
integrated modeling. Um, I have one example in Australia where it's actually, rather than wastewater management or urban drainage, it's actually in a completely different field. And it's an example of where integrated assessment um, was quite successfully applied. Uh, so this was a case study in Adelaide. And I was working on a model that uh, had many different assessment tools. And the idea was to, at the end of, the, um, of modeling, come together with different information about how stormwater management and green infrastructure can benefit uh, various aspects like pollution management, microclimate control, amenity and health. And we presented this tool in Adelaide um, with a local municipality and demonstrated how this tool could be used. And they got on board by bringing in stakeholders from various disciplines like landscape architecture, drainage management, um, and just in general community engagement. And through the process, we applied what was a pretty simple tool um, to the whole, well, a region of the municipality to address some various questions, including the pollution management aspects, as well as um, mitigating urban microclimates, because green infrastructures can help do that. And through the assessment, um, was able to communicate some of the multiple benefits that our water infrastructures can actually bring to society and to management of other, you know, you know like health aspects. Uh, and this was taken on board quite, um, quite readily by the local municipality and they ended up um, writing into their local policy that any new projects need to demonstrate through a, a modeling approach that solutions, whether it's green infrastructure or other kinds of um, uh, stormwater infrastructures can achieve these multiple benefits. So I think, and that's sort of where some of my um, experience comes from and of lessons learned, and that is really communicating openly about the model, being transparent and uh, being pragmatic as well about how complex you make your models, because that can help you really bridge the gap between research and practice. Thank you, Peter and Lorenzo. The, uh, we're running out of time. We are supposed to finish in just a few minutes. So uh, I thank you both for presentations and, and good answering. And uh, remaining questions will be available on um, IVA Connect and we'll, we'll try to, the panelists to, together, will try to answer them within the next few days. And so if you have not received an answer, hopefully you will very soon.